What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Travis Makes Friends podcast. Today, I am not making friends because I've already been friends with today's guest for quite some time now. Yeah. So what's up, man? Welcome to the show. It's about time. It is. It, you know, it's been, what, five years? Yeah. Six years? About. Five years since we started working together? Just about, yeah. So the show's been live for over six years, but I think the first time that I reached out to you was for um, the Grant Cardone interview. Yes. Does that sound right? I, th- I thought it was a cover photo, but you always say it was Grant Cardone. Uh, it could have been a cover photo too, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so basically, uh, Eric, for those of you listening or watching, Eric has been my producer for basically the last five years. Um, started out just doing some editing work here and there, and then um, just gave him some more stuff to do and some more stuff to do and some more stuff to do, and then it basically turned into him moving out to Vegas and you know, 90 to 95% of what you see me post online in the podcast, YouTube, social media mostly comes from him. So, so I, I edited this episode. Yes, correct. <laughs> um, so, so I wanted Eric to come on because there's really cool development that's been happening. Um, <clears throat> and I want to go back to the beginning of when kind of this all started because, um, uh, well, well, we'll go here and then we'll go kind of all the way back to the very beginning. Okay. But, First off, Preacher Boys, the podcast, started three or four years ago. Yeah, December um, 2019. December 2019. And I remember having conversations with you about that um, because it was obviously like you're you're un, you're uncovering abuse in the independent fundamental Baptist movement, yeah. which is the religion that we both grew up in, um, just kind of different churches. Uh, but we would play each other's schools and stuff, and then you were... You were a freshman when I was a senior or something like that. Is that right? Probably. Um, yeah. I think freshman. Because right? I remember your brother's, your, your brother was playing My basketball. My brother's five years older. So. Than you. He, yeah. yeah, he, yeah. I think he would have been a senior when you're like a junior yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I remember, I remember that because I remember seeing the name Skorzynski on the back of his basketball jersey and thinking that that was a fake name. Yeah. Like there was no way that that was somebody's actual last name. Um, and some years <laughs> it was just ski when they couldn't fit it on the back of Wait, the jersey. Wait, really? Yeah. My oh, mom's I didn't ski. know that. Cause I couldn't fit all I the thought words. I made that up for you. Yeah. Well, well it's ski. Okay. Well, <laughs> there goes that. <clears throat> um, so started preacher boys. I remember thinking at the time I was like, well, this is a cool idea, <laughs> bad idea, but well, <laughs> I, I, I didn't think it was a bad idea. I thought it was yeah. a good idea, but I was like, I just don't know how you're going to keep making content. Sure. And here we are <laughs> like four years later, yeah. not only has your show continued to have m- m- content after content after content of continual abuse stories um, inside the independent fundamental Baptist, fundamental Baptist movement, which is a small movement to begin with. But now you have a awesome documentary that's coming out that you yeah. were a talking head for um, that's coming out on investigation discovery and then on HBO max. So um, just tell me, you know, go back to why you started the show to begin with and then and then we'll go from there. It that is cheers, by the way. Thanks oh, yeah. for coming. Cheers. Out. If you're Just Baptist, shout out to Rogue. Trigger warning. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Rogue uh, Dead Guy Ale. This is one of my go-to beers right here. Um, I'd never find it anywhere, so I got some a six pack at some random. Is it a Vegas thing? Uh, no, it's actually Oregon. So, which is where Jackie's from. My wife is from. Um, and, uh, so when, whenever you go up to Oregon, there's like, there's rogue all over the place. There's a brewery up there. Mm. Um, and then yard house used to always have this on tap. So whenever I go to yard house, I would get oh, it gotcha. and then they stopped carrying it like a year huh. ago. So it is good. Um, it is. Yeah. It's really one of my good. favorites. Yeah. No, it is funny. Cause when I started the show, I had the same feeling because I thought if by the end of the year I can get like three or four people, I literally had that conversation with my wife, Tara, I was standing in the kitchen. I was like, if I could get three to five people to talk to me, like, and put together some stuff like abuse stories, <laughs> right? Basically, yeah. On the flip side, I said, if I could get like a hundred people a month listening to the show, that would be great. And it obviously grew a lot bigger than that. Yeah. The reason I started the show was because growing up in the IFB, like, I loved it. <laughs> I think you were the same way. Like, yeah. I didn't, and it wasn't even just that I loved it because it was better than everything else. It was it was the only thing I knew. Sure. So like. All of my good memories, bad memories, indifferent memories were all there. And um, long story short, that bubble of like, we're perfect, nothing bad happens here, that all kind of burst when a predator was shuffled to our church, and I was one of the first people to find out as a 15 or 16-year-old, and started telling leadership, and they just didn't care. And they, beyond that, they were upset I was talking about it. And so... 
Um, it kind of splintered my relationships really quickly. The circle of people I trusted shrunk down really quickly. And I found myself kind of, I don't belong in this movement anymore. Long yada, yada, yada moment. But you were still in that. high school though. Yeah. So. I was doing a podcast and I was saying like the circle of people I trusted was shrinking very, very small, but I had nowhere to go. Cause like you have yeah. to go to school where you go to school, which right. was at the church. You have to go to church where your parents go to church. That's the church. And you had to go do the things your parents were doing, which was hanging out at the church. And so, um, and my friend group was also the church. And so there wasn't really anywhere to go, but you also feel extremely lonely and increasingly lonely over the years. And, um, you know, basically I went from seeing that one incident happen where it's like, I can't believe that happened to realizing that this is something that happens repeatedly across the movement yeah, for decades. Wasn't, it wasn't the exception. Oh, I can't believe this didn't happen sooner. Sort right. of thing. Why did you feel like it was your responsibility to be the one to be like, Hey everybody, maybe we should stop doing this. I didn't feel as far as the show, I didn't feel it was my responsibility. I just felt like it needed to be somebody's responsibility. Hmm. So it was kind of one of those things like, but you were just doing it to more to scratch your own itch. Like, yeah, like you, 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 you did not think that it was going to continue like going or, or think that it was going to become as big as it became. No. Or- like I started the show thinking there's been a great bombshell news article. There's been a great blog that kind of talks about like the funny things in the movement. Yeah. As far as like covering in an ongoing way or in like a even larger way, I hadn't seen it done. And I was sitting there like, because I resonated with those types of stories, I was watching movies like Spotlight and I was reading the actual book that that movie's based on. And I was reading blogs from LDS people and reading about the Catholic church and Leah Remini's content. Like, and I just kept going, where's that for this movement? Mm -hmm. And I was like hoping there'd be somebody to do that in a much bigger and better way than I thought I could at the time. Yeah. And the reason I started the show is just literally it wasn't happening. And I just got to this point where it was like enough's enough. I just need to start doing this. And then it kind of went from there. And then what I find super interesting is that when you started the show, you were no longer like IFB. Yeah. In fact, like when I met you, you weren't really IFB. Like when we really met, because we knew of each other ish. Because we, I was adjacent. You were in Banning, which is you know yeah. Palm Springs area, and I was in Lancaster, which is like LA area. Mm-hmm. And we played each other's schools or whatever, and like heard your name before, whatever. And then we both end up at this church in Fresno. Yeah, I, it was for me. It was post college, and then for you, it was like the it was my the college. Year, right, it, was it was the basically, years basically yeah. where you would have been in college, but instead you decided to yeah. go work, which better decision. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Uh, already at that point, you were basically like, ah, IFB, I don't really, you know, mess with that already. Was that a direct correlation to the abuse that happened or was it more just like, Yeah, I I mean, like, like I said, that was like the bubble burst moment, you know, like it was like, I always thought we're a city set on a hill. We are perfect. And like the Catholics down the road are pedophiles and the, this evangelical church is just trying to get people in by any means, which is so funny now. They're just sensitive, seeker sensitive. And they're the skater church is what they always called them, you know, or, or it was, it was a superiority complex in a big way. And we are the only correct. Right. And with that came a sense of security. And I think when I saw, Oh, because that was the first time I'd ever heard of an abuse story within the IFB, mm. which is hilarious because that tells you how little information we had. <laughs> but for me, it was like, oh, that can happen here. Yeah. It's like when your house gets broken into and you're like, all of a sudden robbery is a real threat. Right. You know, up until then, it's like, they should have locked the doors, right. you know, or exactly. you shouldn't live in that neighborhood, but it can happen anywhere. Should have been wearing that. You know? Right. Yeah, exactly. It is. It's, it's, we tend to, as humans think we got it right. Everyone yeah. else that's been attacked is that's their fault. Of and, course. Um, you know, so for me, it was literally a moment of, you know, my bubble's not safe. And then it put me into research mode, which I was always a question asker. And so I started Googling IFB church abuse. Um, I started Googling every, like at 16, 17, when we'd have a guest speaker, I'd be Googling during the music mm-hmm. portion, like, yeah, yeah. Hey, we're going to have so-and-so come up, Google, who are they? Mm-hmm. Who is this books I could read? Like I was basically investigating, but the only audience was me. <laughs> it's like, who is this person? Who's yeah. this person that we're going on this youth activity with? All that kind of stuff. And, you know, basically over the next couple of years, 
as I found more, it pushed me further and further out. And the movement itself was pushing me out because I was questioning more vocally, yeah. like, and in a very aggressive way. So you're not allowed to do through through high school, where it was like, you know, I was getting in confrontations with leadership, where I'm going, "You're supposed to protect us. You're not." Yeah, and I'm sure you can imagine knowing me, like those conversations weren't happy, <clears throat> calm conversations. And so, um, yeah. And then over, by the time you met me, I would say I was. I was at a point where I was like, that was a false religion. I've kind of now understand the true gospel. Yeah. And I was riding high again, I think a little bit on superiority of like, I got it all figured out. Sure. That's not going to happen again. And, you know, but I was still so adjacent to that world. It's kind of funny now because like (laughs) I was basically still I have. Yeah. Just a version of it though. Cause you were, cause you were reading like a lot of like Calvinism and different mm -hmm. things like that. Right. Like that was more kind of the version of the gospel that you were engaging in, which if, like the way that I was taught in college would be like, whoa, no, like that's yeah, not- I was very passionately <laughs> devoted to Christianity, and I was studying like crazy. Yeah. And I, and to this day, I laugh when people reach out and send me stuff because I'm like, I know exactly where you're going. Yeah, thirty steps down the road because I've studied all your apologetics books, and right. I'm like, so yeah, it was it was that was bad, and then it was just searching mode. And I think one of the things you notice when people leave high control environments or very cultish fundamentalist groups is like, you tend to go from one to another mm-hmm. and like you kind of bump your head on 30 doors on the way out yeah. where it's like, well, it's easier to admit that you were 10% wrong than to admit that you were 100% right. Wrong, you know? Yeah. It's just like, Oh, well, you know, they didn't have that piece. Right. Sure. So let's go, you know, replace it with this other thing. Um, so what I find well, to get back to what I was saying earlier to find what I find fascinating is that you started the show still like very devout Christian. Yeah. And then a couple of years into it was like this, well, this, the whole time was kind of this deconstruction phase that was happening probably in the background that you're realizing it. Um, And then, and then ultimately you ended up putting out a full episode on like, Hey, I feel an obligation to tell everyone listening now, like, this is kind of where I'm at. Like, where do you view the source of that deconstruction beginning to happen? So I think it was happening from the minute that bubble burst. I think it was literally sure, just when you were 15 or 16. Yeah. And I kind of, I told someone the other day, like, I think that the biggest issue with the conversation around deconstruction is that, which is really just thinking <laughs> the biggest issue with the conversation about deconstructing is that people put a, a end point on it and they go, you started your deconstruction journey. And what matters is where you end up. Mm-hmm. And you hear Christians say that and you hear atheists say that. And I think you'd never end up. I think the reason you see cultish fundamentalist groups is that people end up at 20 here and that's where I am. And they stop. And so, but again, to be more specific to that question, I think what instigated it was just, it, it was seeing bad things. Yes. But it was also conversations with people who were good people who weren't Christian, Hmm. who had like, Okay, the the best unsaved person I know lives a life that's equal to or better than the best Christian I know. Mm-hmm. And so like for me it wasn't so much like oh there's so much bad I can't explain bad like cuz there's tons of apologetics for that. For me the conversation was is there any inherent supernatural goodness in Christianity yeah. that can't be seen in Alcoholics Anonymous or Buddhism or any Islam set of values right. or beliefs. Yeah. And it doesn't help that you know, the church is calling out Hollywood is having its own Harvey Weinsteins and its own scandals and its own me too reckoning right. like in a big way. So like it was a mix of both of those. I think people get stuck on, Oh, you're focused on the bad. And it's mm-hmm. like, no, I was actually very actively searching for good and mm-hmm. not finding it, right. which has been not finding the through line. Like yeah. you said, like that, that was a big thing for me. It was just that this is what I used to think was the ultimate source mm-hmm. of all truth, happiness, fulfillment, a good life. Yeah. And then you start seeing some of the bad stuff and you go like, well, they believed all of that Mm -hmm. and they were miserable. They were unhappy. They committed suicide. They were engaging in abuse. They had skeletons in the closet. You see the bad side. And then on the, the other side of that, you go see a bunch of other people who don't have all the same common beliefs and they do have all the happiness and the success and the fulfillment and the family life and like all the other things. So it was like, well, clearly 
This is not the common denominator here. There's another thing that's that all of these people have in common versus what all these people have in common. And that was, to your point, like a big kind of earth shattering moment for me yeah. to, to realize like, oh, maybe not every good and perfect right. gift comes from above. Right. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, but I assume since you were this person uncovering abuse in this in this kind of public forum mm -hmm. and you had this like announcement that you yeah. had to give, which I respect because like you didn't have to give it, but you did feel like your audience deserved to know. Yeah, I think I did you know? because I was so open and I almost used that in the beginning as like, look, I'm a Christian, Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. which, which I think, and that was true. And yeah. it was, it was coming from a place of like, I'm concerned because this is my mm -hmm. home base, but it's like, if you're leading someone one way, like hypocrisy just doesn't sit well with me at this point because of <laughs> my background. So like I felt I owed it to my audience. A lot of people disagreed and said, you don't. Some yeah. people said you owe more, tell us more about your personal life, you know? And then there's people like, you know, like my wife thinks like, no, you don't owe that to anybody. And you know, but for me, it's just, if I feel like I have to do it, I'm going to do it. Sure. That's where it is. It's probably and, always better to err you know, on the side of truth. And people feel like they have openness. to respond a certain way. You know? Yeah. Well, so. like if you're going to live your life publicly, then you kind of have to be open mm -hmm. about some things, you know, um, even if sometimes it's uncomfortable or you feel like you don't have to do it. It's kind yeah. of like, well, but it's I responsibility. It, sure. It's this. Yeah. And I will say on that point, I think the hardest thing is that it doesn't bother me when people respond publicly to me as a public figure. It's like, it's when people think they're entitled to private conversations with me because I'm a public figure mm. where it's like, I have people reach out, you know, that, Hey, hop on a call with me, yeah. you know? And it's like, I don't know who you are. Like you don't even have your name or profile picture. <clears throat> right. You're just an anonymous account saying I have more experience in life than you do. And I right. want to talk to you about it. You yeah. Know? From this position of but, like helpful authority. Yeah. Yeah. Because, well, you're just, you know, you're going astray right now, Eric. So yeah. why don't we sit down and well, and they're always talk. About I've been it. there. Yeah. I know where you're at, but, and it's just, and I appreciate it, but sure. it's also, I don't. <laughs> I know <laughs> kind exactly of what you mean. I Like, I know how I felt when I was in it. Sure. So I appreciate where they're coming from, but because I'm not in it now, it doesn't resonate with me the way it is with the person sending the message. Well, you know, you know what doesn't resonate with me about it is that it's most often from people who seemingly only care that I end up on the same page with them. Right. Rather than caring about me as an like individual. Holistically, yeah. you. Like, yeah. like it's, you only care about me within the context of bringing me back to believing what you believe. And if I don't, then you have no use for me. Yeah. And that to me is like the complete opposite of really what you're supposed to be doing as like a Jesus follower. Like that's yeah. not what Jesus did if you truly believe all of that. So like you're already violating the way that you're supposed to be. Yeah. In do, like in trying to get me back to being like you are, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a futile effort. Yeah. You know what I mean? It right. doesn't, it doesn't it, like, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make me want to go hang out and spend time with you and hear what you have to say yeah. about it. You know, it just, where are we going with this and why are we having <laughs> right. this discussion? Yeah. That agenda is hard to, it's a big hurdle to jump over for me. It's yeah. like when I feel like it's a transactional <laughs> You know, and Asami, who I just had on the show recently, um, on one of my episodes, like she said, it was us versus them, and our only goal was to make them us. <clears throat> and if they won't become us, then we're not talking to them. Right. You know, and it was like, oh, that's such a smart way to put it, because that's very much. It was like, are you a convert? No. All right, we're gonna love bomb you until you become one, <laughs> and then if that's yeah. not working, we're gonna just ditch you and yep. we're out. You know? <clears throat> yep, exactly. Yeah, you're a prospect. Yeah, yeah, you're in the pipeline. <clears throat> Got to convert you. You know, right. or mark you off as a loss, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. <laughs> so we right. can move on and literally mark you off in yeah. churches, right? right, right. Keeping that analytics of who's of course. doing churches what. are businesses right. at the end of the day. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they have to be. Yeah. Set the record straight, Eric. Got it. How much did I try to evangelize you into leaving the church? Yeah. I mean, I remember you sitting down with me a lot of times <laughs> trying to, you know, and uh, I remember you just, you ripped the Bible out of my hands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, that's what I appreciate about you <laughs> oh, was when we had conversations, and I think, and I hope that was mutual, is that, you know, because I think when we first started working together, we were on very polar opposite ends <clears throat> of the spectrum. But I don't feel like we would talk about religion, but I don't think I ever was trying to be a magnet pulling you one way. No, no, yeah. I think there was a lot of listening happening. I always which, felt like you were just asking me questions. Right. And I was like, well, this is kind of where I ended up. Yeah. And I, and, and I felt like there was a holistic 
oh, I care about this person and that's it. And mm. um, so, yeah, I mean, it was never, you know, I know people, I think a lot of people have the assumption that you played a big part yeah. and you actually played a very, like a significantly very small part yeah. in that process. And I think for the I most a, I get part, a lot of credit. Yeah. This, you get a lot of credit for, for like me multiple people. Christianity. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> really. I feel like it was more, I would give you updates about like, here's where I'm at. Yeah. You know? Right. And you'd be like, okay, let's film, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And like, it was very much not that. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's, it's not Travis's fault. Yeah, that was a selfish question. Um, I like to think I pulled you out. I just want to, <laughs> yeah, <I'm just> <laughs> I just want to click that later. and yeah. send it to people. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, really, I think it was, and I think that's the thing that I want to add to that. I think that's the biggest thing that has made me not care what a lot of people think is, because I've had people that call talking mad shit about you or write messages, or I hear about conversations that are had about, well, he's with Travis, he's working with Travis and whatever, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, one of the, th and, and people that have also had a lot of vitriol toward me as I've gone through things or, or treated me completely differently. And one of the things I can say is that from point A to point, wherever I am now, I don't feel like you ever treated me like a different person. Yeah. But now I have Christians reaching out to me who very much do. And they'll say, you know, I know Travis thinks this or whatever, but I'm like, okay, so I'm going to listen to one of you in conversation or have a conversation with one of you, I should say, am I going to do the person who on every point of the journey has been consistently a friend or am I going to be the person who's sit down with the person who's going, I love Eric. Eric's the best until I start doing something other than what you think I should be doing. And then your whole demeanor toward me changes. And so it's kind of one of those things where it's like people's opinion of you hasn't really mattered to me because the way they've treated me has been so much of a roller coaster. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say that like, I mean, that's been my experience with, I would say 99% of Christians that I've dealt with. Yeah. And, and like, I try to be optimistic and generous with that stuff, but like truly, I've had far more negative encounters with Christians at this point than yeah. Same. Aside from, I would say the ones I've had on my show who are like experts and authors who I would say they get treated horribly by. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's so what's kind the of interesting weird, piece, yeah. right? Is like the, the Christians that I've had the best experiences with are also the Christians well, they who me... other Christians make them feel like they're not enough to. Well, I've interviewed some <clears throat> Christians who make me go, Hmm, like almost like those people where it's like, I want to know more like they're yeah. the Bible you're reading kind of people where right. you truly go. Like I got done with a call with one in particular and I was like, wow, she's incredible. Her book's incredible. It's made me think a lot. You know, she's very much from a history. Like there's a lot of compelling things mm -hmm. and they go to Twitter and it's like every Christian is saying they're a heretic and I hate them. And I'm like, so do I join your thing and join you? Or right. like, do I just wait for you to become a heretic? all the way to, right. <laughs> because exactly. like, there's only so much abuse a person can take, yeah, you know? Exactly. <laughs> Man, this beer makes you really burpy, huh? <laughs> this is a good choice. You're welcome for those listening. You just hear little like garkles and You won't hear swallows. that when I'm done editing this episode. <laughs> That's why I feel like I kind of ended up where I ended mm. up, you know? It's just, it. the proof is in the pudding a lot right. of times, and like, you can't extricate the system from well, the people, you know what I mean? Judge them by their fruit. Right. And, and I think that is, that's a, I still think that's a beautiful metric in every area, just like many biblical proverbs and truths are mm -hmm. like, you'll know them by the fruit. And to me, the fruit of the religious communities that I've encountered, and I would say religious communities, even beyond Christians, I would say there's nothing again, every group and organization has rotten fruit somewhere, right? but there's an abundance of rotten fruit. And there's no unexplainable, like, how did they make this fruit? <laughs> yeah. And it's, <laughs> you know, and like it's an abundance of rotten fruit deeply tied to the core beliefs of right. the system. Mm -hmm. It's not like, it's not the outliers that are making stuff up. It's, it's like, if, if you are engaging yeah. in the core doctrine, then you, then you have this rotten fruit associated yeah. with you. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, that's kind of a, that's kind of a problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, right. if you follow it to its, to, to a T. If you're fundamentalist about it. Sure. You know, right. which, which, which is, is almost even more respectable in some cases, you know, which I think we're tip, you know, tap dancing through a minefield when you start talking about that. But like, I think that's one of the things that was hard for me, you know, through the deconstruction process is like when I'm reading old Testament passages, which it's all God, you know, like when you're reading an old Testament passage that says, 
you know, if a woman is raped in a field and doesn't cry out, she should be stoned. And then you're interviewing psychologists who are saying people freeze during assaults, or you're interviewing a survivor who says, you know, I froze up and I couldn't even move. I didn't want to speak. I couldn't scream. It's like, so I'm sitting there across from somebody who should be stoned to death Mm -hmm. for being assaulted by a pastor. Like, okay, I can't make sense of this. Mm -hmm. And like, just saying, oh, that was then (laughs) it's like, right. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make that go away. And it certainly doesn't, especially under the guise of like, well, God never changes. Right. It's like, well, it seems like he did. Immutability is a big, yeah. He kind of, kind of flipped the, right. You know, uh, his opinion on that one. Yeah. Because we would all agree that that's probably not a good way to go about. Yeah. And it feels like he would have known. I mean, it feels like he would have known that would have been out of, out of style by the time we got to the next book. Exactly. So it's just, it's just, that's the stuff that's hard for me. And again, I, I'm, I'm maybe being more flippant than I would normally be on my show, but like, it is, it is something hard where I think a lot of Christians just, I've studied too much. Like I know my Bible too well. And there's too many things that are just, I mean, some of that stuff, like I said, like the way that rape victims are dealt with in the Bible, it's not a book of justice for rape victims. Right. (laughs) And so, but I say that, you know, I say that with all due respect to close friends or pastors who, who see it and interpret it different ways. But I think that's the point is they have to interpret it a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And and like I've always said, anytime I talk about this on the show and for those of you listening, this isn't your cup of tea on an episode, then there's plenty of other episodes to listen to. I don't know nothing to do with religion and abuse. (laughs) But but I normally just, I'm very much like a, if you believe something and it serves you and your community and your family well, and it does not hurt Mm -hmm. other people, then I am 100% on board. It does not bother me. It doesn't bother me. Like the problem is that a lot of, a lot of these systems at their core it for a lot of these people that believe them to their core, they're designed to hurt other people. And so there's a lot of that that happens. I, I I think, and I hope as a culture, we're kind of moving beyond some of those things. And even the people who are kind of like the, you know, the Jesus freaks of the day or apply that to any religion that's not having to do with Jesus. They, they tend to be more of that, like, Kind of what I've always said is like the 20, they get the 20% right. They get the 80% wrong. It's mm-hmm. like, love people, be good, be kind. Like yeah. those types of things, all very good. And, and, a, and a lot of, a lot of the, the world's religions are centered around these kind of core values that everybody shares. But then so many people just get lost in that 80% trying to piece yeah. together what this means and what that means. And you're bad and you're wrong. And, and, and to the lethal to the de- consequences, exactly to yeah. the degree that we're actually going to hurt you. Right. Because we think you're causing this much harm to our mission, which surpasses anything that you could possibly fathom. So, I mean, you see it play out with, I mean, Israel and Palestine, which I'm not going into this topic in depth, but all I'll say about that is who owns the land very much is rooted a lot in how two largely different religious groups interpret who God gave land to. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, and again, I'm, I'll, I'm stepping out of this topic the minute I step into it, but like, there are a lot of Israeli people that believe God gave them from this border to this border. There's mm-hmm. a lot of Palestinians that believe that their version of God gave them this border. And, and there's a lot of variation in political things beyond that. But like, as far as Christians deciding who they ally with in certain things, as far as like, you can just see it there. Like, just look at the way the Middle East over the last several thousands of years has gotten parsed up and split up and wars. So much of that is rooted in radical interpretations of the Quran, religious the Bible, yeah. the Torah, the, and, you know, it's again, I think like when you get beyond those things that like you said of love each other, because I think there's evolutionary benefit to religion where it's like, we need to all work together. Mm-hmm. We need to find common principles that we unite us. Well, if you look back to like when we right. were just savages on the planet, yeah. just murdering each other because yeah. you didn't recognize somebody, it's like, oh, that's not one of the 80 people that I know. Yeah. So they must be an enemy. Let's kill them. Like and the civil war you're talking take about. Take their, <laughs> no, no, we're going like way, be, yeah, yeah, yeah. way further no. back in time. Yeah, yeah. But like when we were like just pure savages. Yeah. Like I don't religion, recognize you, you're a threat. Yeah. Right. Religion actually helped bring people together and taught them some things on how to start treating people better. And so like, there's some good things that come from it for sure. 
but ultimately it's also led to a lot of death, Mm -hmm. a lot of destruction, a lot of holy wars, um, and a lot of, a lot of other BS that, um, uh, I think is now beginning to be more of a psychological effect rather than, you know, physical. Yeah. Well, it became, it, it becomes, we divide and separate based on disagreements versus like baseline agreements. That's the thing is like, it's such a low bar is like, be good to others and yeah. what's best for the tribe, you know? Mm-hmm. And like, we've gone so far past that conversation of like, how do I make you part of my tribe exactly. by any means necessary? And if you don't become a part of it, then like, we don't have anything to talk about mm-hmm. that, that was at, where, at best, right. at worst, we're right. going to kill We're you. enemies. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. That, that was why, that's why I always say it. It's just like, I have no interest in deconverting somebody from a religion or converting somebody into a religion or making somebody believe everything that I believe. I have no interest in doing any of that. My only interest is just to get people to think for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's just like, as long as you can articulate some version of this is what I believe and this is why I believe it. Mm -hmm. And it does not hurt anybody else. And it provides a great set of, of morals and boundaries and values for you and your family to live by. Great. Like more power to you. Just do not come over to my world yeah. and start telling me how terrible of a person that I am and start preaching at me because I disagree with some of this 80% right. that you're talking about. Cause I think it's <clears throat> almost surprising sometimes to like Christian friends who will like interact with me and see firsthand that I still maintain a high level of integrity. Like yeah. I still have high character. I still have, certain attributes and and values that I hold dear that, that prevent me from, you know, willfully hurting others. And I think that it almost surprises them like, Oh my gosh, how, how are you doing that? You know, outside of God. And it's like, well, it's not, that's not the prerequisite to just treating people. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Like you can do that. (laughs) In fact, in fact, to me, that's kind of where that whole like morality thing um, dissipates a little bit. It's like, assuming evolution is real, which I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying if you assume that that's the worldview that we're talking about, then would it not make sense that we evolved over tens of thousands of years to really figure out that like, Hmm, maybe killing people is not the way to like live, to like continue society and, and have good relationships and be happy and fulfilled. Hmm. Maybe not taking other people's stuff is probably a bad thing. Maybe doing like, you know, why, why, like, why is there some sort of like, Mm -hmm. why do you think that there has to be, somebody with that's the moral arbiter. Why, why would we right. not just evolve to understand those things to be true? Right. Well, I mean, um, I always struggle with that apologetic of like, cause people would ask me like, where do you get your morals from? Mm-hmm. You know? And that's kind well, of, I'm sure you get to come from lawgivers. Eric. Yeah. Right. And, um, it was reading Dr. Brian Kloss's book, which is called corruptible. And it's a book all about power, which I recommend to anybody listening because it's not focused solely on religion. Like it talks about law enforcement and politics and like, Basically, the whole premise of the book is how the worst people end up in power because they're the ones that desire it the most. And we create systems that (laughs) bolster those people. And it's a very interesting book. Um, Depending on whatever side of the aisle you're on on any topic, you can start seeing things that just make sense. Um, But that book, in the very beginning of the book, he kind of gives morals from an evolutionary perspective like you're talking about. And it's very much that. It's like when you start realizing that's what's best for the community is best for the individual Mm -hmm. and that, you know, you can go around killing each other, but eventually someone's going to end up killing you. Mm -hmm. Like it, it creates a framework in which it, it was the first time I ever had that question answered where I was like, Oh, I get how we got here. Yeah. Like it makes sense why we have speed limits, Mm -hmm. you know, as much as you don't like following them, it makes sense why we have, but it makes sense why we've developed things that, don't necessarily just benefit us, mm-hmm. but like, you know, again, wild, wild west, you go around and just shoot somebody in a town. Mm-hmm. Like we've progressed past that because anybody's going to get shot. It's any not given super time, conducive you know? for right. the settlement. Yeah. You know? And I think just innately, like we protect our own, you mm-hmm. know, I think mm-hmm. that's a natural, just creaturely thing that we do. Yeah. You know? Well, it's a, kind of get back on the path of the whole preacher boys thing and the doc that's coming out and now that everyone's avoid, turned off the episode. Yeah, exactly. Like, avoid the apologetics discussion. Cause we could go for hours talking about that stuff. Um, uh, so for preacher boys specifically, this doc's coming out. Mm-hmm. So tell me a little bit about the documentary and how long this has been on the works. Yeah. So the documentary called let us pray, which is going to be out on uh, investigation discovery. Pray, November 24th. P-R-E-Y. P-R-E-Y comes out November 24th and November 25th. It's a two part 
event on Investigation Discovery's channel. So if you have basic cable, Investigation Discovery as a channel, and then it'll stream concurrently on Max, um, HBO Max is what it used to be called. Um, and it'll be four episodes, two drop one night, two drop the next night. So it's a lot of content about the IFB packaged by an Emmy winning director and producer and featuring a lot of incredible people, most of which I've had on my show in the past. Um, the series has been in the works since 2019, I think maybe 2018, but 2019 Crazy. for sure. Um, and that was when the team started researching it, developing like, who do we talk to reading articles, like doing all of the pre work, um, 2020, like end of 2020, they reached out to me and, you know, they had already been in it. Like I think a year, um, they interviewed me on zoom for like two hours and cut together what they ended up selling as a, as a series. Um, and then, yeah, from there, I mean, I filmed with them in three different States for one full day of interviews, uh, one day, like kind of protesting at a church and then one day going to an actual, um, like sentencing hearing, which was really, really cool. Um, and yeah, then they've been this is all throughout 2021. That was all through 2021. 2022 is all like post-production stuff, legal stuff. Cause I, as you can imagine, like there's a lot of pastors that don't want clips of them used in this series. Um, and then they announced it why. like two weeks ago. Yeah. So, um, it's going to be pretty amazing. Like it's, it's, it goes back to that thing of like, I wanted somebody more talented and mm. with more resources to make something incredible. Yeah. And well, that's what's interesting about your like your Instagram handle and Facebook handle and yeah. everything is Preacher Boys Doc. Yeah. Well, originally that I thought the, the that's what plan. I could do. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was like I could find three people. Yeah. And then it became like the podcast is what I always say is a happy accident. It was yeah. like I never expected to do that, but now like the podcast has become bigger than I think what I could have done with the documentary. Yeah. And the docu series now is going to be something that I think is you know, potentially bigger than what the podcast has done, you know, if not, I mean, it's all hand in hand. So like at the yeah. end of the day, I'm not going to be like, they're bigger than my thing, you know, yeah. or vice versa. Um, I'm just glad that it's going to get in front of people I would never get. So here's my question, bro. Like I said, yeah. when you started this, I was all for it. And, and again, this is around the time that we were like, you were helping me film and produce an entire course on like starting podcasts yeah. and, and all you're this other stuff. Very much the and, reason I even thought podcasting was an option. Well, yeah. And, and then like, so when, I remember you kind of discussing the idea with me and I was like, I mean, it sounds like a great idea. It's just like, like I said, I, I don't know how you're like, I'm all about consistency and long term, And I was just like, I don't know how this show is continuing to go yeah. in four years. Cause like, you know, mm -hmm. run out of stuff to talk about and disappointingly and unfortunately and alarmingly, yeah. you continue to find abuse stories just in the IFB, which yeah. is like what? 6 million people on the planet. Maybe, yeah. you know, like it's a very small percentage of religion. Mm -hmm. Um, and the Christ, like the sect of Christianity overall. I mean, there's like two point something billion Christians on the planet yeah. and like 6 million of them are IFB. And those are the ones that and they're are the right. only ones that got it right. Yeah, those are the That's only correct ones. Um, um, so my question is from the context of like now, some of the people that you're reporting on, like I, I know them. Mm -hmm. Like I went to college with yeah. them. I went to high school competing yeah. against them. Like I know these people who have done some heinous, yeah. disgusting, atrocious things yeah. in this super, super tiny, like why, why, why is this, why is the IFB just a breeding ground for some of this disgusting behavior? Yeah. I mean, I think you get what you allow. And I think, I mean, that's the shortest answer to it. I think you get what you allow. You know, I look at the church I grew up in and the story I kind of alluded to earlier, like they had somebody who had an active warrant come to the church. Their dad, who was the pastor of the church they were at, sent him there to go be there. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody really knew. He blended right in. Did the pastor of the church know? He says he didn't fully know, but it's all did not know. He knew something. Yeah. What what well, I, I remember was told, when all this went down too, because I yeah. was it it kind of directly it's your affected college me. and stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, the pastor told me that the pastor of the church that sent the predator, which was his son, he said that he told him that they had a ministry disagreement. 
And that's why he was leaving the that's church. That's a pretty big ministry. Which I do <laughs> believe that's highly possible because that's kind of how they say that kind of stuff. Um, but like, I just have this belief that you should <laughs> you should take him in. Um, you know, but it, it comes down to like I expose that pretty quickly to leadership there. He was there for well over a decade after that, and was his wife was on staff. He was singing and leading music from the pulpit. He was babysitting people's kids in the church. Like, I mean, he had full access and people knew who he was. Yeah. You know, the people who were allowing him to babysit, I mean, they knew he was, he pled no contest to this crime. And they still go babysit my daughters. You know, right. like that's a weird thing. And um, so I say that to say, fast forward to, you know, they left a year ago or two years ago. The new vice principal gets arrested for molesting a teenage girl. Now, I'm not saying that he read Jesse's story and went, oh, I'll go there. What an inspiration. Yeah, right. But I also think when you're sitting there and you have this interest, which unless you have the interest, it's like trying to understand the serial killer. Why do you have this interest? Right. You know, you can't tell me that it didn't play a factor in him feeling safe to act on his desires mm-hmm. in that environment. And so I think that's what you see at First Baptist Church of Hammond, at North Valley, at all of these different churches is that at a certain point, you're seeing slaps on the wrist for heinous crimes. Yeah. If you are, if you have an inclination to those heinous crimes, you're going to go to the place where the least amount of chance of you getting punished is going to be. Yeah. You know, like I think if they publicly outed you and, you know, kicked you out of the church and contacted authorities, I don't think then, like, I don't think it's likely another person in the next year is going to say, hey, let me dive in, you know, and, yeah. and be here. So I, I think it's that. I think it's like broadcasting a message like, it's okay. There's a lot of theological stuff where it's like the way women are taught about the way that, you know, women are to be silent in the church, like mm-hmm. literally to be silenced in the church. And that if you're immodest, then being yeah. raped is your fault type of a thing. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> but the, the, the short answer I think that's like the most substantive is, is they've put out a beacon saying we're okay with this. And so as long as you don't, as long as you don't like jeopardize the mission. Right. That's kind of, that's, that's where I feel like the scary part is, is like when you feel like you have this mission. Yeah that is heavenly mm-hmm. and supersedes anything yeah. on earth. Yeah. Then you, you have this unbridled permission to, to sweep anything under the rug that would potentially harm that mission. Well, and it goes, that's where it gets into the theology side is like in a culture where men are valued more than women, which they are in mm-hmm. the IFB, that's a baseline. Mm-hmm. Women are inferior to men. Yeah. Well, like the Bible college degrees that the women get in IFB are almost laughable. You can get a minor in crockpot cooking at Hiles Anderson College. Legitimately. That's not a joke. You can get a minor in crockpot cooking. As a woman. canning. Yes. Like those are classes. The reason they go to college is to get married. Right. They don't go to college to learn things. So when you get to that situation, it's like, we're going to sweep it under the rug to protect the guy in the church. Mm Mm-hmm. And then we're going to throw the victim under the bus to protect the church. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's this radically just messed up world Mm -hmm. where like, again, it's a slap on the wrist for them. And then it's all the weight and responsibility. It's why I always say when you start talking about purity culture and like women are objectified and women are blamed for where they were and what they were like purity culture in the church and rape culture are literally the exact same thing. They tie together very well. They're, they're the same. Like you don't get more beyond like women are objects to like, then calling them a stumbling block for tripping up the man of God. Like yeah. you are an object that messed up the chance of this ministry being something bigger. Yeah. And like to put that weight on women from the time they're like infants Yeah. to, you know, your whole life you're told you're going to stumble somebody, you're going to mess this up yeah. for everybody. Like, well, who's the lot. bad guy in Samson and Delilah? Right. Yeah. Not Samson. Yeah. You know, he becomes the hero. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, well, he's the one that chose to mess up. Yeah. Like that's part of being a, a man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Is being able to make your own decisions and to take responsibility for the decisions that you do make. Mm-hmm. And it's wild to me that this stuff just continues yeah. to every time you make a post, bro. I'm like, 
are you serious? Again, like yeah. another one. Yeah. Like, do you guys not see this account? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you not know that this exists? You think you're just not going to get caught? Like, what's the end game when you're grooming a 13 year old? Yeah. As a youth pastor in a ministry that it's already been called out for sexual scandal. Yeah. And you're doing now you're doing things with that 13 year old who's now 14 or 15. Like, wh- again, what's the what's the end yeah, game? Right. You just think that you're never going to get caught. You're doing stuff on campus. Yeah. In classrooms yeah. with underage girls. Like, what are you doing, dude? Yeah. Like, how is this? How was it even a thought that entered your brain that was like, oh, this is okay. Yeah. You know, like not immediately, like if you caught yourself thinking it yeah. to just be like, that is an impossible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Let me quit my job. There's like yeah. an infinite number of possibilities that are far better than That's... that scenario actually playing out. If you think yeah. that you had a temptation yeah. where like, I could see myself going down this path, move, Yeah. like go, go somewhere go else, work at a bank somewhere. Yeah. Like it's... move out of the state, <laughs> like, get out of there, yeah. go it, get somewhere else, man. I don't understand it. I don't know. It blows my mind. I don't know. And these I... are the same people that are going to talk shit about me and you for like not going to church anymore. Yeah. It's like, if you could anticipate it, you would prevent it. But these guys are so good at like, just they walk in charismatic and own the place. And like, and I think that goes to their head is of like, yeah. Oh my God, they can't even tell. Right. Like they have no clue. I mean, I, I, I talked to a friend who's a survivor who literally was assaulted by her youth pastor. And then he went up and preached a sermon on purity, like within like the hour. I just have this theory that this is absolutely not a blanket statement. So please do not send this Clip. to your pastor friends. Okay. But I think that that position inherently attracts this kind of narcissistic personality because it's such a position of power even more so than like a regular public speaker or leader because you have this like this you're you're the conduit through which god speaks Mm -hmm. to an entire audience of people yeah it it attracts these types of personalities that are almost like seeking that type of you know adoration yeah i mean this is a long conversation and there's a lot of ways to look at this. The short answer is yes. Like it is going to attract people. And this goes back to the book I mentioned corruptible by Brian Kloss, which you you should have him on on your show, but he, um, he talks about how power is attracted to power. Like people that are, um, bad people tend to be attracted to power because they're bad people and they want power to do bad things. Mm -hmm. And so you see that financially, you see that with people in positions of politics. Um, he gives the example in his book of, um, this is the best way to explain it is like, again, when we talk about systems, like when you create a system where you're going to be revered as the man of God and like, we're all going to put ourselves in full submission to you. Mm-hmm. Who does that draw? <laughs> not, right. not typically good people. You can have good people that take that position with a lot of responsibility, mm-hmm. but it's a system where it's why I say every IFB church is a powder kick ready to explode is that. All it takes is the wrong person with a match, and that system will perfectly set yeah. everybody up to be hurt. Um, it's like a, it's like anything else: benevolent dictatorship versus a non-benevolent di- dictatorship. It's like if one guy has, holds all the power, you're putting a lot of stock in one guy. Um, but the example in Brian Kloss's book is two different police departments. One in New Zealand releases an ad for recruitment featuring police officers helping people in the community. So it's a funny ad. They've got all the police officers. They're not strapped up with a bunch of guns and stuff. They're just walking around in uniforms, helping old ladies across the street, you know, helping a kid fix their bike, like serving the community. Um, The quality of recruitments based on that ad was the best that they'd ever had in that region. I think it was New Zealand, but wherever it was, it was the best quality recruitments they'd ever had. People that were generally tested being very kind, great. Like it transformed that department in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. Atlanta released a ad for recruitment featuring the Punisher school logo flashing up on the screen, this armored vehicle pulling up them coming out, loading their guns, like very cool, like Rambo style police department. The quality of recruitment for that was very poor. And the people that were applying tended to people be people that would abuse power. Mm -hmm. And so it basically points to the fact that the way you present the position is going to affect the level of candidate that comes in. And so I think that's where it goes back to the leadership convo is when you see 
Jack Kyle surrounded by 16, you know, schoolgirls in uniform singing, we love you preacher. Oh yes, we do. Like, which legitimately happened and bringing him his favorite candy and saying, oh, we love you preacher and all this stuff. Okay. What kind of guys are going to be attracted to that? Mm -hmm. I certainly don't want that. That sounds very creepy to me. (laughs) It sounds like it's going to attract guys that are, you know, want to have a lot of power and have a bunch of schoolgirls singing in a circle. We love you preacher. And so like, it all goes back to what is the pattern, what's presented as the option. And then again, you're going to draw those types of people. And I think that's why some of the best people, you know, in the church had no desire to be pastors because hmm. they didn't yeah. want that position. They wanted they were the to help people. Yeah. They were the volunteers. Right. They wanted to help people. They're the people that are like, I'm going to go make cookies for VBS in the kitchen. Yeah. And they're yeah. the sweetest old lady you ever met. Mm-hmm. But like, right. they had no desire to rule over anybody. Right. <laughs> you know, it's a different, it's, it's all, it all goes back to environment. And I think that's where like breeding ground is a good term or like, I think of it just as a magnet. It's like corruption attracts corrupt people, you know? So where do you think that the IFP movement is headed in the next decade, two decades? I mean, it's been dying for years. I I think, I don't think it'll be gone in the next decade. I think there will always be, you know, some form of it. Yeah. I think it's heyday is long past gone. Yeah. Um, I don't think we'll ever see a resurgence of like the Jack Kyle style, 60,000 member, yeah. 30 buses running. Um, and I think I, I, or even a West coast. Um, yeah. Or I'll, even I'll West coast, a couple thousand. I mean, they're dwindling down quite a bit. Um, I mean, just their conferences are very small turnout versus what they were. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that's from infighting within the own denomination. Mm-hmm. Um, Yeah, I think it's going to keep dwindling. I think, you know, my goal isn't to change the leadership. I think it's more awareness of people who are just see the church on the corner that like looks like your grandmother's church where it's like, oh, it's a cute, everyone's wearing Sunday dresses and this. I think there's an appeal and a nostalgia now to the movement that draws people in. Yeah. Of like, oh, this feels different. It feels Mm -hmm. culturally very different. Sure. Um, I just don't see the system itself is so messed up. And I think people in society are too educated to cults. At least becoming too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the same reason the Mormons are struggling with ways they've never struggled before. It's the same reason that Islam is struggling. It's like, there's too much Scientology. There's too much information easily accessible. Yeah. And again, when you Google. And that just happened. Right. Yeah. This is an unprecedented thing right. where it's like the fact that I can, the fact that someone's watching this. Yeah. Like, 20 years ago, I would have had to get on Fox news to reach my region Mm -hmm. of Vegas with this information. And the fact now that I can rank for a church's name and people can see my stuff before they see the church website. Well, I was even thinking that dude, cause I had a friend who told me, um, his, his little sister was a senior in high school Mm -hmm. at where I went to school and I guess one of her friends got suspended because she watched something of mine and like said something to the teacher or the principal about something that I said on something on a podcast or something like that. And like, at first I was like, ah, that kind of sucks. But also I was also like, well, kind of good for her. And then like the last thought I had was it's awesome that the kids that are in these types of situations now have access to information that at least allows them yeah. to start a uh, start an internal dialogue without feeling completely crazy, right. without feeling like I'm going to die and go to hell now, mm-hmm. without seeing, without knowing that the only example that exists of somebody who left what I'm in right now is some dude sermon example of yeah so and so died in a car accident or became addicted to drugs or got or, AIDS from having sex one time right or, yeah right or like you know sold sold his daughter's pair of shoes for one more drop of liquor or yeah. whatever the thing is, you know what I yeah. mean? So like it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's cool. And I, and I think that that will have a direct correlation to the suffering of that movement yeah. over the next like 10, 15 years, because yeah. this is so new. Like yeah. we're in the, I mean, five years maybe of like abundance information like that, yeah, like, like could potentially mean a decade plus, like if you're really good on Google and stuff, but now it's becoming the norm. Yeah. It's not becoming like, like even when we were in high school, it's like, well, you got to go to Google. Google existed, but you got to go use it. Yeah. And now it's like the main form of media consumption is not Nickelodeon. It's TikTok. Yeah. And it's podcasts well, and it's YouTube. You I know? mean, I, I mean, there's so many times I've seen 
girl is a victim at a church within a few weeks she's on tiktok sharing her story Mm -hmm. because nobody will listen in her community and it's like that's awesome like Mm -hmm. that's such a it's a movement that predicated itself on we have it's very much like what we used to hear about the catholic church like we have the bible chained to the podium and like the people don't have it we have it Mm -hmm. and it's like you had these guys that were like we have the pulpit we have the microphone we have the power and now the microphone has been passed to a completely different generation mm-hmm. of people in different demographic of people yeah. to where, like you said, you know, a teenage girl with no voice in her church can amass thousands or millions of people to mm-hmm. hear her story and then create change, yeah. you know, like. And now I hope it, now I hope really just that like the leaders inside of the movement will just start kind of call, we'll just start calling it we'll just start being morally responsible adult human beings yeah. do the baseline and start, exactly yeah. exactly come Even, up to the baseline which is just reporting on stuff that's terrible and like there, there was funny you posted the press release for the documentary and there was two different responses on there that i took note of and one of them was this lady who was saying like who's blaming you basically mm-hmm. and saying like you're going to give account for all the lost souls yeah. that aren't going to hear the gospel or who had turned to, who, who turned away from Jesus mm-hmm. because they saw you talking about the bad things in the church and i was like what a horribly toxic poisonous response to somebody who's calling out child abuse yeah. like that's <laughs> that's the dangerous thing not to get too far down this rabbit hole again but that's the dangerous thing about like platforming what you believe yeah. over what we know to be true it's like well you know heaven hell like that's all pretty i mean it's conjecture like you're kind of guessing they're kind of guessing we're all kind of guessing and maybe you're right and i don't know but like what i do know is that this 11 year old girl didn't ask for any of it. Yeah. Like that's happening in front of us. Yeah. And if Jesus were here, he would be pretty concerned with that. Don't you think? You know what I mean? And then the other response that I saw in that post was like this pastor who is just genuinely grieved, who is just kind of like, it sickens me to see that this is something that's affecting our movement. And, I and like I hope everybody knows that if anything happened inside of my church, it would be reported immediately and blah blah blah. And I was like, that that is what needs to happen That's more right. because like bottom line, nobody in the IFB is going to listen to me or you. Yeah. You know, m- I mean, nobody, most people are not except for the people who are already beginning to well, question listen. things. Yeah. <laughs> they prepare sermons. I've <laughs> exactly. had sermons for each of I, but You know I, what I mean? Like, but like the people that are going to make a change are going to be the people who start calling it out within the context of yeah. that world. And you have to ask yourself, like, do I want to stay in the system that enabled this to happen? Yeah. Well, I think, pretty much the entire process of becoming a better version of yourself starts with just asking the right questions anyway. Ah, I see what you did. I see how you turned that around. (laughs) (laughs) This is the only reason I wanted to do this interview. Um, Hour and 10 minutes and we're in there. (laughs) It's just that that's, that's like the basis is like self-examination, constant Mm self-examination just to understand that, Hey, maybe I might be wrong about something mm-hmm. like the, the, the thing that I looked to be ironclad, bulletproof, 100% right. Maybe might not be that way. Yeah. And, but like, how else are you ever going to figure that out? Mm-hmm. And then the question that I was like burning inside of me for a long time was like, what are the odds that I'm a hundred percent right? Mm. That I was just born into being 100% right. Well, you said, into a denomination of less than 8,000 churches. Yeah. Right. Like probably not too good. Yeah. Like it's like, you again, the maybe lottery. the core stuff. Okay. Like that's a conversation we can have, but like a hundred percent, right? Like you're for sure. Like and you know, to the point I'll say everyone else is wrong with certainty. Yeah. Like girls wearing skirts, movie theaters, like shaving, you know, like we're right about all that. Like there's not something that we can question here. And then if you ask a question, it's not okay. Like, and then these, I don't know why when you said shaving, I thought you meant girls wearing skirts. I was thinking shaving your legs. And I was uh, like, that's such a weird thing to zero in on. I was like, that's such a (laughs) random thing to throw in there. He's like, no, that's why basically I never wear shirts and ties. That's why you never wear skirts. That's why I never wear skirts. That's why I have a beard. Yeah. I just, uh, don't do anything that I was supposed to do growing up, but I also just got to a point in my life where I just, the questions, yeah, like, you know, that what I posted on Twitter the other, or X the other day, which was, I'd rather have questions mm-hmm. that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. And the first part of my life was all about answers that can't be questioned. Yeah. And if somebody didn't know the answer, then it wasn't 
It didn't put the magnifying glass on the person who didn't have the answer to the question. All they would do is say, well, you should go talk to so-and-so because they know more than I do. And it was like, it was almost a red flag to me where I was like, yeah, if you don't know, you what's know, like it doesn't bother you that you don't know this. Like you have to defer to this person because they're like more, you know, well studied than you are. Well, the, if the if the answers all default to the people who are the most well studied, mm. then how do we know that we're the right ones? Yeah. Because there's a lot of well studied people and no always to, people disagree. Yeah, you have no <laughs> way to verify them. It's right. just a very slippery slope, for lack of a better word. But. Slippery, slippery slope. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, so really the antidote in your opinion is what, like, how do we, how, how does the IFB kind of course correct? And then how do you kind of feel, you know, fall into all of this? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think the IFB can course correct. That's my personal opinion. Um, I mean, I, I, can they course correct in terms of how they handle this? Yes. I mean, everything else is like philosophical, philosophically speaking. I don't know. I mean, cause they're so rooted in we don't change, which I think is an antidote or a, which I think is a recipe for disaster. I mean, I, old time religion, maybe. Yeah. I think it's a disaster when you say I'm done changing. So I think the two part answer is I think the biggest way they can change is just taking this seriously and creating systems that protect innocent people in their churches, which, which it just know. seems like such an easy lift. It's yeah, it is. Which is why, like at this point, if they're not changing, that's why I say I don't have hope they will. Because yeah, yeah. it's not lack of information, right. and it's not lack of experience of things happening. It's just a decision not to do it. Well, um, they just chalk you up to the devil, just like well, right. you know, preacher boys and yeah. the documentary He's that's not coming even out. A Christian, yeah. It's just like that's the devil attacking um, our church because they know we have the truth. And it's right. like yeah. not everything's the devil, man. You know, it's the devil abuse of minors yeah like i i think people in the i think people in the pews i think the i think it's learning to think i think that is the number one thing you can learn because i think the issue the issue with the conversations about everything is where do you end up or where do you end up like you started thinking about this where did you end up and i guess i'm at a point now where i think the most sane people are the people that don't end up somewhere. Yeah. They've developed a process for processing information mm -hmm. and that is what guides them. It's not so much the final destination. Yeah. It is very much the journey in which when you receive information, how do you process it and how do you choose what to apply and what not to apply? And I think if more people could develop that skill, a lot more people would be safe coming from like the person in the pew perspective. And I think a lot of pastors would be, radically transforming the way that they operate their churches. But I think, unfortunately, I think fundamentalist religion and thought don't go hand in hand. Yeah. So I think you have to sacrifice one for the other. And, Bro, you know, I was, I was thinking through some of those yeah. hymns the other day, there's literally a song that's called trust and obey. Yeah. Trust and obey. <laughs> there's no other way. Cause there's no <laughs> other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Huh? Like that's literally telling you not to think. Yeah. It's like, Oh, you have a question. Just trust. Yeah. And obey. Well, it's all thought terminated. Doesn't matter. Cliches. It's like right. you, you know, God's ways are not your ways. God works in mysterious ways. Um, our thoughts are not his thoughts. You know, like it, it's, it is a system that is radically designed to stop thinking. Mm -hmm. And when you do start thinking, then you're not allowed in the system. So, right. you know, is that a cult? Maybe. <laughs> is, is that a cult? That's the title of this episode. Yeah. Right. Is it a cult? Um, well, listen, dude, um, we should do this more often. Um, chit chat. Yeah, after the, I mean, the funny thing is after the series comes out, there'll probably be a lot of conversation to yeah. be had, Yeah. but it's like, right now it's kind of this thing of like, I hope it's good. Yeah. It's going to be good. <laughs> you know, well, that's, I forget, um, you haven't seen it. Yeah. I haven't seen yeah. it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I've everything I have seen and like the conversations I've had, you know, I went out to dinner with, uh, people that are making and had a lot of conversations. I've had hours and hours of discussion. I was interviewed for hours and hours. Um, you know, shout out to the production assistant, bringing me so many Red Bulls that day. Um, I, you can blow through a Red Bull budget. Yes, I can. Um, I have utmost faith. It's going to be amazing. Um, and I think it's coming from the right place. And I think for those that are willing to hear, I think there's a lot of things that are going to change perspectives in it. Um, so yeah. what would you say as kind of a last, you know, final send off here, <clears throat> what would you say to somebody watching this who 
maybe like is also hurt and upset by a lot of the abuse that's happened in that world. Mm -hmm. Maybe didn't realize a lot of it was happening. Mm -hmm. Maybe feel terribly bad for the people that they involved in that world because they just didn't know what was going on. What, like, I, I guess, what would you say to those people who, who are still like deeply saddened and hurt by all the things that are happening, but are also deeply saddened and hurt at the position that you've ended up in? If sure. that makes sense. Like, what would you say to those people? Yeah, I empathize with that position a lot more than I think some people do <laughs> that leave the church. I think some people leave and it's like, I'm leaving and I'm burning it to a crisp, you yeah. know, behind me. Yeah. And, you know, and I understand, again, I'm too empathetic. I understand that sure. perspective too, because there's a lot of bullshit in that world yeah. where- and, and, and frankly, like me and you got off easy. Yes. I, I had the best of a bad situation. You know, I think in retrospect- Am I never, are my parents never walking through the doors of the church I grew up in? Yes. Um, but there were a lot worse churches I could have walked through, which is funny given what I just talked about. Um, I think for the people that are, so for the people that are watching that are, don't like abuse, they still ardently believe in Christianity. They're disappointed with where I ended up. I mean, I guess my, I'm not good at consoling people in this situation. I think the biggest thing that I'll say is take solace in the fact that I'll tell you where I'm at. And it's better for me to be honest about where I'm at than to lie and say, I agree with you and be going to hell anyway. <laughs> so I guess like uh, pat on the shoulder, that makes everyone feel better, but it is really much, it is really very much this thing of, I get people that are hurt and don't like the idea of me going to hell. Mm -hmm. And I, and I say that flippantly I, or it sounds flippant. I don't mean it flippantly. Cause I know I used to feel that way about people and it broke my heart that like, Oh, so-and-so I know mm -hmm. that I love my, this uncle is amazing and they're going to go burn for eternity. That's like a really stressful position to be in. I think, I mean, I mean, I, I'm not any less, <laughs> This is not consoling at all. I think I'm I'm not I'm not going to hell any less by openly talking about not believing. And I guess except that there's not a hypocrisy there and I'm open with where I'm at. And I'm open to having conversation. Like I guess at the end of the day, I do empathize. I love a lot of people that are still very devoutly Christian. And I'm open to conversations as long as you're loving me for where I'm at and not loving me with a goal in mind. That's what I was going to say. And um, yeah, at the end of the day, you're still you. Yeah. At the end of the day, I'm still me. And I think that a lot of. And pretending you know, doesn't help anyone. I guess yeah. that's like that. That's the thing where I say like, I'm not ended up anywhere. I could be in 10 years. I don't, I, right now I don't see it. Yeah. I could be in 10 years spiritual yep. about something yeah, or same. religious about something. Um, I, it won't be the movement I left cause it's, I see things that are clearly not possibly true. Sure. Like there's very clear things, but you know, I'm not in my final destination. So let's love each other through the process and have conversations. And it doesn't need to be a game of tug of war with our belief systems, you know? Okay. And I think, you know, beyond that, like, I, I don't know, I know at the end of the day, like if you believe someone disagrees with you, they're going to hell. Like yeah. that's something you have to work through. But like I said, I'm not going to hell anymore, any less by not just wearing a suit and pretending I agree with you. Like yeah. just based on your own religion. So um, that's how encouraging that was. <laughs> but, but, uh, the final, the final no, thing I, for me too is that yeah. of like, the two of us, let's yeah. Like not me and you, like me in person listening or you in person. I can person see you listening. going to hell far more than me. Well, I mean that's at this point. Oh, it's <laughs> almost it's almost guaranteed. Um, I of the two of us, like me and the person listening or you and the person listening. I am the only one of the two of us that's ever questioned from an honest place what I believe. Mm -hmm. All I ask is for you to do the same. And if you end up where you are now, yeah, great. And I still love you for it. And like, that's the thing is that, and it's a problem. And I'm like, let's still, keep questioning. You're still you. I'm still me. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Like it's, it's the, like, the like you said, is I, the danger. I could like, be, yeah. I could end up back in a church in a decade from now, in five years from now. Like I could that's end up crazy. <laughs> I don't know what kind of church. <laughs> I don't know where, I don't know for what reasons, but yeah. the bottom line is I could, but I know that to be true for myself. Because I've adopted this I'm value. I'm truly open to that being possible Correct. in five years. Yeah. Correct. Exactly. That, and that's what I mean is that like, that's why I say like address those people because like you, I, I feel a, 
a high amount of empathy and a lot of people that I genuinely care for and love deeply. And there's nothing you can say. You can't be world. like, Hey, I don't believe in hell. So it's so good. <laughs> right. Cause like they truly do. And that's a really hard spot yeah. to, well, now especially cause in. now they view it as me affecting my own kids. That's kind of what, what I feel about like anybody in that position. I just, mm-hmm. I, I have a tremendous amount of empathy for where they are and I still genuinely love and care about them and I love that they still love and care about me. And they, most of them. Well, yeah, some of them. I, I mean, I'm talking about the people who actually do. Like, I'm talking about my ladies, actual friends. The sweet old ladies at church. And exactly. I think the people that you grew up with that still. The people that are like my genuine friends and people who genuinely do care about me. And I know there are some people that in there that, are, that are exist like that. Some of them don't give a shit about me. Yeah, that's mainly <laughs> but, what I hear. <laughs> are the people who don't give a shit. Usually when people talk to me, they don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're not saying good things. Um, but yeah, I just feel. I, I feel that way about it where like, I know that you look at me like you think you're doing what's best for me and you know that I have kids now mm-hmm. and that, and that affects the yeah. way that you view that I'm raising my kids and that my kids aren't going to be, you know, exposed yeah. to these types to, to the truth yeah. and all this other stuff. So it's like, it, it's, it's, it's just one of those balancing acts, man. It's just one of those things where you want to be, res- I, I have no interest in being disrespectful towards something that somebody holds dear. While at the same time, I still have to express it's, it's the way that I feel It's a balancing about act. It. It's like, I respect the human who believes us. But then there's like things where it's like, I'm not going to say that makes sense. Right. <laughs> right. You know, it's, it's, it's tricky, you know, but like there's things like, again, there's things I would say privately. I would never say on a podcast just because like what <laughs> <laughs> you've heard them, but, but it's stuff like, I don't want to, I don't want to alienate somebody. It's, but again, it's, it's objectively like, I, I, unhelpful. I, but again, it's one of those things, though, where it's like, I think people listening to that who I am tiptoeing for, it's like, why do you need people to tiptoe? If you're secure in what you believe. Yeah. Exactly. Or if you're secure, like, again, it's not about what you, it's like, are you secure in the process in which you determine what you believe? Which is non existent for most people, which is the problem. I think for most people, it's like, it's like, this is my grandma's kind of exactly. church. There's no process. You know? It's and, just what they were told. Yeah. And you have people that go, they didn't care about religion until they had kids. And now it's like, I don't want my kids to go to hell, but they never stopped to think, why am I worried about my kids going? You know, it, it's a lot of layers to it that gets messy, but yeah. Well, anyway, dude, I appreciate coming note, to the show. Let um, us pray. November yeah. 24th. Let us pray. P R E Y. When I heard the, when I heard the title, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. But then I saw the title and I was like, oh, oh. pray. Yeah, that's, someone that's was not bad. happy because the title's on like an upside down Bible with like an upside down cross on the top. Wait, what? The logo. Someone someone was not happy, you're saying? Yeah, someone was not happy because there was an upside down cross. Because it's like a Bible uh, cover. It says, let us pray, and the cross is gotcha. upside down. They're like, uh, love what so you're, you're doing, worshiping the devil, but that's huh? satanic. Yeah. And then it was funny because they recommended, they're like, could I suggest a cross like crossed out? And I was like, is that... Is that better? <laughs> don't put the cross upside down. Put an X through it. And I was like, I don't feel I can con- I can put you in contact with the marketing team. It was just a funny thing where I was like, is that better? Yeah. I don't know. It's I just, it was weird. It was a weird comment. Let us pray. Let us pray. November 24th. Investigation discovery. Yep. And then two day HBO event. Max. So November 24th, November 25th, Black Friday deals are not what they used to be. So stay home and watch it. That's true. And if not, it's going to be streaming on Max. Also, but if you're still waiting in Black Friday lines, you're a lunatic. Well, Prime Day is way better than Black Literally Friday. Literally a lunatic. Yeah, like, I don't understand. Way better. Um, so, but the TVs, it used to be legit. Yeah. I bought my first ever computer on Black well, Friday for like a hundred bucks. Yeah. Well, again, pre but Amazon Prime. Now Day. that's like every other Tuesday is yeah. like buy a computer for a hundred dollars. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it comes out on Black Friday, then the next day, then it streams on Prime or <laughs> it streams on hey, Amazon. Another yeah. plug for Amazon. <laughs> and it streams on uh, HBO Max concurrently, which I believe means at the same time or the next day. I would assume it's gonna drop then drop the next day on yeah. Max. But watch it please live. Because I want it to be like one of Investigation Discovery's best ever live events that they do. So I will certainly be doing that. And I hope uh, some of you that are in the audience that have absolutely no background or history or context into the way that I grew up or the way that Eric grew up or any of his stuff will will check it out and yeah. uh, and get a little bit of a perspective. Yeah, you won't be lost. I, I know enough of the structure of the documentary to know if you don't know this world and you want a crash course – and you want something like the vow, how it kind of breaks down, this will do that. So like yeah. 
There's not a barrier to entry. Like if you can watch it, yeah, you, you will like, understand. If you like it. true yeah. crime, cult docs, like that kind of a stuff, yeah. like you're going to Which enjoy is funny. this. I hate that stuff. Do you really? I hate true crime. Interesting. Not to wait, keep but extending the episode. But true crime, like murder or mystery. I hate stuff. all of it. <laughs> It's the best advertisement for this. No, no, no. No, I mean, I legitimately hate true crime. Like, I don't watch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, no, no. This is true. I want to say this because people send me stuff all the time. Because of what I do, people yeah. send me the Ted Bundy documentary and that. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you. So I do a true crime podcast, which is why this is probably a bombshell yeah. announcement. <laughs> so, so I don't. Uh, my mental capacity for true crime is my show. Like, I see me. Like, yeah. once I get done recording Preacher Boys or yeah. editing a Preacher Boys episode, I'm not sitting there going like some people on Netflix where it's like, where is every true crime doc? That's fair. Well, when you have this like mental space that you have to exist in, yeah. to produce your and show, I, and I don't just like you don't want to spend it. your entire to be clear, I'm very deep it. and heavy topics all the time with people. Um, but anyway, all that to say, I hate it. And so like when the Ted Bundy documentary came out, I watched it in like 20 minute increments and was like, I hate this. this is so Turn heavy. it off. Yeah. It was so good, but I, it's just, it's a, it's a lot, but all that to say, you should go watch this one, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, but it is, it really is. It's a heavy, heavy thing, but I think it's important to talk about, but it I is, think it's a finally thing. It's a finally yes. thing. It's just like so many people well, associate abuse in the Catholic church, but it's just like, yeah. there's this has never been talked about right. on a stage like this. Yeah. So I, would, I genuinely, bro, like I'm very proud of yeah. the work that you've done to put into this. And then to have this like third party come out of nowhere. That was like, yes, there's some fishy things happening here. And then it's validating. Yeah. It's, right. It's very exactly. validating to have somebody who didn't grow up in it. Cause yeah. then there's no, like, are we all crazy? Yeah, it's well, like, and there's not a, con- there's not a bias. That's like, I want to destroy yeah. them because they destroyed my which, life, which is ter- which is like terrifying. And also very freeing is that they're looking at it purely from the outside. So like whatever we think is crazy, if they think it's crazy, it's validating. If there's something that we don't know, it's just a good extra person to pass it through. Sure. Um, but I'm, I'm super pumped for it. I'm really excited for it. Um, it is overdue. And I will say on that front, like for those of you in the IFB who are like, Oh, this is really sensitive stuff. I, I, I can't handle it specifically. I will say knowing probably, I don't know how many people total are in the doc, but I would say I know 95% of them. Like I know how hard it was for them to tell their story. So like, don't put off watching it because it's going to be hard to hear it. Hmm. Like they put the effort and I know I was interviewed for like four hours and I know some of the people were interviewed for five, six, seven, like long days of filming, yeah. living the worst part of their life. Like yeah. the least you could do is listen and support the show. But let us pray. Yeah, HBO pray. Max and Investigation Discovery. Bro, thanks for coming on. We'll probably do a part yeah. two after this thing airs. But uh, yeah, if you're watching this, listening to this right now, go check it out. Should be at worst case entertaining and give you perspective into yeah. how if you how love I grew true up, crime, you're you know? gonna love it. And a lot of people listen to the show <laughs> yeah. like they've heard me say stuff like, mm-hmm. "Oh, I grew up this way" or whatever. And it, but it's always kind of passing. We never really dive into it. They're gonna text you and be like, "Bro, so this might be I didn't a, know. This might be a perspective shift crazy. a little bit." So. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you guys next time. Peace.